All right, my guest this afternoon is known as an actor's actor. Throughout his 60-plus years in showbiz, he has appeared on stage, television, in the big screen. On stage, he received rave reviews for his spot-on portrayal of former New York City Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia in the play His Honor. On the small screen, he starred as the undefeated heavyweight champion Rocky Marciano in Marciano and again in the film The Rocky Marciano Story alongside George C. Scott. He has also appeared in television shows such as Police Story, Murder, She Wrote, Law and Order, Get Smart, The Streets of San Francisco, The Paper Chase, Jesse in Lo in La Romana with Gina Lola with excuse me in La Rom in hold on in La Romana with the lovely Gina Lola Brigida. Notice how I saved her for the end. Um, he has also won two Emmy Awards for his work on the video honoring. V- v- uh, he has also won two Emmy Awards for his work on the video honoring veterans called "Just a Common Soldier," which to this day has received almost twenty six. Excuse me, more than twenty six million views. In nineteen seventy, he played Ray Fernandez in, as the murderous gigolo in the cult classic film "The Honeymoon Killers," but. He is probably best known for playing the role as Sal Boca alongside Gene Hackman and Roy Scheider in, the, in William Freakin's 1971 masterpiece, The French Connection. It is my honor to have him as a guest on my show today. Director, producer, writer, and legendary actor, Mr. Tony Lobianco. First of all, Tony, thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon to be on my show. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Just the one one correction, okay, if, I, if you might, because it's very important to me about our veterans. Uh, it's just a common soldier. Oh, what did I say? A- and you said just a common cause. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> and also, that. it's over 26 million oh, views. excellent. Okay, we've grown. <laughs> oh, beautiful. God bless. Thank you. It's great to hear. Yeah, that's, great to hear. I urge everyone to go see that because... It is really touching, and uh, it's only a five-minute video. Right. I did it out of the love of my heart uh, for our, our beautiful veterans, and it's something that we uh, we should all respect and honor each day for our existence, Absolutely. because those are the people that have uh, kept us safe and uh, and made America great. Amen. I mean, for those people who have, we're going to play that on the outro on the way after the show's over. We're going to play that for my audience. And for oh, the people, I appreciate it. For that. the people that haven't listened to it, I mean, it's really so poetic and it brings tears to your eyes. And you did a marvelous job. And on 26 million views, I mean, that's it's amazing. And um, I'm sure it's going to keep going and going forever. Thank you. First of all, I mean, like I said, I want to thank you for coming on the show. And like I said, I think we talked earlier. I'm an actor myself, and being a first generation Italian American, I want to thank you for paving the way for guys like myself and a lot of people like myself. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And, um, you know, you're a true gentleman. Thank you, sir. Um, so Tony, I want to start off in the early part of your life, in your early, you know, young young age. I mean, you're, you're a vocational school. I mean, how did you know you wanted to be an actor? Well, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I went to, a, as you said, I went to a vocational high school. And uh, I was very... Um, <clears throat> Active as a young man, active. What does that mean? It means that I was uh, somewhat physical in the a- idea of uh, playing a lot of sports, uh, leading teams. Uh, I mean, I even led a stickball team when I was eight years old. I had my own stickball team, and, I, and guys on my t- guys on my team were twelve years old and and up. And uh, and just that image. You know, when I go back and try to uh, answer that question, which is asked quite often, um, I keep I keep trying to r- realize, you know, why? How, how did I become an actor? And all throughout my career, I, uh, or my life, I should say, young life, I was either the leader of the team, the all star first baseman, the boxing and the Golden Gloves, you know, uh, um, just just kind of that kind of thing. So I mean, it was always a somewhat of an audience out there, I guess. <laughs> and uh, and when uh, I had this one teacher in, in school, and God bless her, uh, Patricia Jacobson, she, in this vocational high school, which I had absolutely no interest in going to, but it, but this teacher, Pat Jacobson, happened to, happened to be a uh, speech and uh, drama uh, class in a vocational high school, which is rather unusual. And she happened to like me and she 
would cut me out of class and sort of took a special interest in me and and she which I'll always be grateful for the teachers uh, and she um, sort of guided my life in terms of speaking better uh, you know just in terms of of appreciation of I guess finer things in life to say the least I mean she introduced she said the contest just happened to come around at that time and she wanted and she had me enter it and I did this poem uh, and oddly enough it was a poem about a young soldier uh, dying in a foxhole and then finally seeing God for the mm. first time mm. and having a conversation with God and that sort of touched my heart in a sensitive way and and uh, what she, what uh, we did was, I competed uh, with that poem in my uh, in my class, and I won. And then we competed in my school, and I won. And then we were competed in the district, uh, and I won. Hit the trifecta. Com- Hit the trifecta. And then I competed in all of Brooklyn, and I won. And there I was representing Brooklyn in the city finals. Amazing. With the, uh, you know. But uh, by then I was I was uh, graduating high school, and so what did it, what was my uh, uh, talent? I guess it was that. Wow. From um, uh, you know I was too right. I wasn't fast enough to be a, a baseball player or good enough to be a professional boxer. Thank God. And, <laughs> and even though even though I did get the opportunity to to play Rocky Marciano, the only undefeated right. heavyweight champ of the world, and maybe because of my boxing ability as a kid uh, and my sports background, but that's what sort of launched me after after high school. Uh, I called schools around to see what what school I should go to, and I was looking for the the cheapest, most <laughs> prominent, yeah, you yeah. know, the one with the most names, the, with, with the least amount of cost. Hey, listen, at that time there was a Lindy's, the famous Lindy's uh, restaurant. There was a Jack Dempsey's. Uh, you know, there was great. There were great things well, going Pat, on. Patsy's is it, the only place that's still around. Yeah, what's that? that? I think Patsy's is like the only place. Oh, stay. Patsy's is my favorite. Oh, I my that. my friends, Sal. my friends are. We're always at Patsy's. Oh, Sal wow. and those guys, uh, the most generous, yeah, wonderful right. people in in the world. It was it was Frank Sinatra's hangout. Yeah, yeah, too, yeah. You know, yeah. So the first year I was there, the teacher uh, said to me, "I want you to teach acting here." And I said, what? what do you mean I'm a student? I'm 20 years old. He said, yeah. I said, you can't. I, you, I, I'm not going to teach act these are young kids like me. You have to be very sensitive. Right, young, right. You have to eat. And he yes, said to me, that's right. You know that. He said, that's where I want you to teach. So I taught for a year as I was studying. And, uh, and then I uh, did some plays up there. I did a wonderful play called The Adding Machine, hmm. which is written in 1929 by Elmer Rice. Wow. And this play, this play uh, um, uh, was a beautiful play, sort of, sort of uh, foretold the future in a way, because what it did was um, talk about a machine taking over a person's job. <laughs> which we we find uh, yes, quite we uh, uh, happening right now. Now, um, I also, I see my belief in acting is uh, about be turning and becoming another human being, not me. And uh, I'm just an instrument or a piece of clay to be molded into another human being. Uh, as I've done that throughout my career, as of today, it gets you into a lot of trouble because people don't know how to cast you. Uh, and rather than rather than understanding that you can do this, that, and the other thing and stuff that they can't imagine you doing, they generally want to, as they say, typecast you and not see the forest from the trees. Right, right, exactly. So, so what happens is uh, uh, you do a role that uh, in this particular case, I was all of 20, 21 years old, and I was playing a, a 55-year-old man. And uh, as, as I did have contracts, uh, agent contracts, many agents had come to see the show and were impressed that this young boy can play these, these kind of roles. Uh, 
it only went so far, you know. Uh, it got me in. It got me into the, those offices and so on and so forth. And but then, as soon as they, they did that, they they wanted me to play, uh, you know, Police Story and and Sal Boca and uh, you know all the other and this, the other Babe Milano and, and mm. Fist and so on and so forth, which are all great roles. Believe me, I swear. I don't. I don't. I don't. Uh, uh, I'm not sorry if I played any of them because they they were all very good roles and and generally uh the bad guy is the best role so uh yeah so uh but uh but i i like to stretch and i like to be different like right now what i do is i i go around as a uh, fiorello laguardia and what it, was it about fiorello laguardia guardia that, that attracted you to play him well again it was foretelling the future with the past Mm. The past of of uh, the, when he was mayor from 1934 to 1945, and he was the 99th mayor, by the way, of New York City. Mm. Uh, he uh, the things that happen now, uh, what happened back then, we don't seem to get it. We don't seem to understand uh, our uh, our history. In in fact, as you know, it's not being taught anymore in schools. No. Uh, no, no. Along with cursive, that's not being taught. People don't know how to write. Don't know how to don't know how to do anything uh, except to keep their head buried in a little computer or a little phone or so on and so forth. That's 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 the history of today, and the result of today of the result of machines taking over people and and lacking communication. So, but as far as LaGuardia is concerned. All the issues that uh, <clears throat> that are plaguing us today, I, I reference in LaGuardia's time. Uh, there is uh, many things that are going on uh, back then are going on right now, and I love giving an audience a revelation and a and an awareness and awakening uh, to what's happening. And because to me, I believe that acting uh, is a way of communicating a situation, a problem. Uh, uh, something that the audience will go away with and uh, f correct in their lives if it's, if it's missing. So, uh, 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 you know, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest uh, moments when I did a view from the bridge on Broadway, uh, a person and his wife, a man and his wife were outside waiting for me. And when I came out, the man who was shaken and tears in his eyes said to me, how do you know? Hmm. And that's the best. Right. That's the best compliment you can exactly. get. You know, so so it's that kind of revelation that you're always looking for when you're performing or speaking. Uh, that the that an audience will come away not just going away. Oh, wasn't that fun? And talk about something else. That's right, right. boring to me. It's not worth it. Speaking Don't come. Go go watch a comedy on on television or something. <laughs> speaking you know? of a view from go, the, sorry. Speaking yeah. of a view from the bridge. Um, you were eighteen years old, and Arthur Miller walks into your workshop. How was that? Hey, how do you know about that? That's uh, right. Uh, just, some people know how to put a carburetor back together in fifteen twenty minutes. This is what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that was exciting as heck. I tell you, I was at the actors. Amazing. I was at the dramatic workshop, and I'm just. I went to I went to acting school October fourth, nineteen fifty four. Wow! You know, uh, and I was uh, all of seventeen, turning eighteen on the nineteenth of October, and uh, and Arthur Miller, uh, the great Arthur Miller, comes into our school and he talks to us, and then he does a scene where with two kids uh, doing a view from the bridge, and I looked at that scene, listened to the words, and said. I am going to do that play on Broadway one day. Wow. And some 28 years later or so, here I am doing it on Broadway, being the first actor ever to play A View from the Bridge in a full-length play on Broadway. Wow. And With Arthur Miller and walking down, you know, having dinner with him and then walking up to the marquee where both of our names over the title. And I say to him, look at that. Not bad for two kids from Brooklyn. Not huh? bad at all. Not bad at all. <laughs> Speaking of Brooklyn, I mean, something's in the water over there because so many amazing actors like yourself have come out of there. Do you consider it a blessing that you were born and raised in Brooklyn? Oh, boy, do I ever. Wow. Brooklyn Brooklyn is the best place to have been born in and, and in my particular time, too, because <clears throat> we had, we had uh, uh, 
competition. Competition meaning uh, roughing it up, meaning uh, you, nothing was handed to you. Things were difficult. Things were tough. Uh, the streets were tough. The people were tough. It was My father was a cab driver. Mm. Sometimes he made no money a day sitting on the hack stand, you know. Uh, back then, the, the drop in a taxi cab was 10 cents. Wow, imagine that. And he would sit in the cab all, all day and not make one dime and, and have to come home. And, and uh, you know, I felt all those things and yeah, all that. Yeah, yeah, all because, that yeah. It becomes part of you, you know, the struggle, the grit. That's right. And that, that makes you rich. Right. People don't become, people today think they're victims. Oh, no victims. Gosh. There are no victims. They're all full of baloney. Yeah. Get out there and overcome it, and, right. and be, a, be a you know, put it, put your pa- your man pants on. Right. And, and same thing goes for ladies too. Uh, don't don't uh, wallow about. in in oh me. Get out Poor there me, and, yeah, and right. overcome. Why, why me? Right. Why me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and well, that's what you're supposed to do. You're in a, you're an American for God's sake. Greatest sakes. country on the Pardon planet. Me. Yeah, you're, you're, everything you can is right there for you to do. And also, you must not have a child's mentality. You know, it, it, those kind of things happen to you. You have those things you grow up with. And the richness of the stories that your parents told you about the struggling they had yeah. is, is probably one of the reasons why I have such a well of, of information in my body to, that makes me theatrical. Right. The idea of when my mother tells me stories about her at being taken out of school when she was eight years old, so she had to be so, so coached to support the family in uh, in Howard clothing. And when the and when the inspectors came around, they'd hide her in the in the lit, in the toilet, you know, uh, area uh, to keep her out of the way, and then come. You know, those are stories. Those are real stories. Yeah. And, 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 you know, dramatic drama and so on and so forth. So you don't just lie there with those stories. You overcome them. Yeah. Mistakes. Like I said. Mistakes I, are valuable. Right. Like I said, my parents came here from the old country. They didn't ask for nothing. They went to work. They broke their asses. And, they, they you know, they raised the family and they made the American dream. And, they, you know, they're happy. And God bless them. And oh, that's we, right. And it wasn't easy. You know, it was a struggle, obviously. Yeah, it was a struggle no. like everybody else. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And uh, this is a country, just be grateful you were born here and stop crying all the time right. and becoming a snowflake and, and oh, I'm right. so tender, I'm so, oh, you're hurting my feelings. Right, right. A it, lot of baloney. There's a reason why people come over here in tire tubes, for a reason. <laughs> That's you know, right. They That's come right. Here for a reason. There's a great country. That's and, right. You know, get out there and work exactly. and cry. You know, please, exactly. I, I, don't get me started, Tony. <laughs> yeah, I'm with anyway, you, pal. I'm with uh, you. Yeah. Tony, uh, you make your film debut in this, The Sex Perils of Paulette in 1965, playing the role of Anthony Greco. Talk a little bit. Acting is all, sometimes acting and luck, excuse me, timing and luck are really good for actors. You know what I mean? Uh, talk about how you got that role. God, I know. It's, it's, it's something I'm not, I don't even, uh, you know, it's such a long time yeah. ago that uh, it was it was a... Uh, it was a, I guess it was a desperate time <laughs> because, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a stage actor and doing a, a movie like that was just because I'd never been in the film and I wanted to see what that was like. And it's not a film that uh, and I'm proud of at all. I, I was an exploitation film that was, uh, mm. thank God I didn't have to do anything uh, yeah, right. uh, that I would be embarrassed <laughs> about, you know. Uh, uh, so uh, it was just a... a stupid film but I, it, it gave me I, I looked at it one time to see you know and right. it was really nothing it's, it's a nothing movie yeah. and, and I I did you know I did fairly well for not doing and doing nothing basically <laughs> but but I count my first movie really as uh, The Honeymoon Killers right right I want to talk about you that you know uh, yeah, that was a yeah. I mean, for people who don't know the honeymoon, uh, the honeymoon, yeah, the honeymoon is <laughs> the, the honeymoon killers. Um, it's based on a 1969 uh, true story of the Lonely Hearts Club members in the the late 1940s. Um, there was a, I, I don't know what you even call them boyfriend girlfriend whatever the hell you call them, but um, you you played the murderous gigolo Ray Fernandez who preyed on lonely women. Talk a little bit about that role and um, how you got that well, one. Well, there you are. That that's a true story. Uh, as was French Connection, as Seven Ups, as all the movies I like to do, mm. true stories. And it was, a, in fact, they were the 
Martha Beck, who is his, uh, who turned out to be his girlfriend, uh, she went. There, she was the second woman ever to go through the electric chair, uh, as he did as well at the end. Because what happened was uh, how how I got that role, I guess, is more interesting than you know. You should go. Who's ever listening should go see that movie. It's one well, of yeah, it's, favorite, it's, a, it's a little disturbing, films. but it, it's it's a cult classic. Oh yeah, it's a cult classic. And but uh, interesting, I was doing a theater for free, naturally, uh, <laughs> in the in the early '60s. And the uh, actress Marilyn Marilyn Chris came to me and said, "You know, they're casting this part over there. You should go for it. You'd be wonderful." So I called the people, and they said, "You know, uh, no, oh, I'm sorry, uh, no, no, world. How old are you?" I said, "I don't know, thirty something like that." She, they said, "No, no, and you're much too young." And we're only we want to see people with their authentic authentic uh, accents. So okay, bye. So I was still going on about my free work at the at the theater that I was the artistic director of, called the Triangle Theater. And uh, Marilyn came to me and said, "You know, they they still haven't cast that part." You should. So I went up there, and the woman said, "What are you doing here?" I said, "I want to do this part. I understand I'm very right for it." So she said, "But Baroni," I said, "Just a minute." I put my hand on my hair, pulled it back, turned away, turned back, and spoke to her in the accent. She said, oh, 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 my gosh. Yeah, okay, I'll send you in. So I went in, and I spoke w- with the producer, producers there with the accent, and uh, eventually uh, spoke to them more, and then read, read for the part and got it right oh. then and there. Wow. And they said, do you mind uh, reading with the other, to, to, so they're trying to cast the other actress, actress. So I, I said, I'd be fine and be happy. So well, we're going on and on. About a week later, uh, one of the producers says to the other, do you think we could send him to school to learn to speak English? <laughs> so, you know, because I had not spoken to them without the accent right. for a week. No matter, in between, no, no, always with the accent. So uh, one guy, the, the casting woman said, I've got to tell you, he, he doesn't have the a- an accent. So they said, that, uh, would you speak to us without the accent? I said, no, sir, not until I sign the contract. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> and, and I didn't until I signed the contract. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I knew even then. <laughs> yeah, right, right. You had, you so had an act. we did that movie. It was a, it was a, a thrilling, a thrilling experience. Yeah, very, and it's a very good movie. Yeah, and we yeah. achieved so much in the, in without the effects yes, there was of no, all yeah, the things right. that they do now, you know, except uh, for the, except the, for the scene. I think, he, I think I read some backstory on it. There was a, there was a condom on someone's head for a blood pack. Could be yes, <laughs> yes, like yes. There was something like that. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I think what it was, it was made for one hundred and twenty-five thousand yeah, dollars. Yeah, very, very, very short budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. And, but the, but the acting, the acting is marvelous. I mean, Shirley Stoller turned uh, to be the uh, my love interest, and my proposed as my girlfriend. But she was. You see, all these women. It, it, he, what he would do, Ray Fernandez, is he would go around. Uh, they'd answer these lonely hearts letters. Mm. He'd meet with them. He'd uh, romance them, get their money, and if they caused him a problem, he'd kill them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. very, you know, that was his job. That was his business. Yeah, he mentions so, it. You mentioned that in the movie. This is my business. Yeah, yes, he's a businessman. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, <laughs> and, and so what happens is this, this one uh, lady uh, answered the letter, and and what happens, she sort of falls in love with him and threatens to kill herself if she, he doesn't see her again. And so he figures, well, let's make it easy. I'll, I'll tell her what I do. So he does, and she says she doesn't care. She loves him anyway, and she wants to go with him. And she'll pose as his sister yes, right. on these on these things. So that's what she does. But I urge everybody to see yeah, that movie. Yeah. It's, a, it's a it's you have to get it on. Uh, I don't know, like the buy. Yeah, it's out there. I mean, I, I recently I watched well, it recently. Yeah. It's a uh, quick backstory. Um, Martin Scorsese originally started directing that film. That's true. He got fired. <laughs> Would you believe? <laughs> Imagine he that. He got fired. He got fired because he was panning. Too many yeah. scenes and, and wasting too much. Yeah, film. it'd be impossible to edit. It's impossible to edit it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the guy who takes over, Leonard Castle, he, he directs it. And he, that's the only thing he ever did in his whole career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he he wasn't. He took over the last week and a half 
of the film, mm. and uh, he didn't. He didn't know. Yeah, go ahead. But, go ahead. I'm but, sorry. But, I didn't but anyway, I'm sorry. No, no. I don't yeah. So then I just I, because I can, as you can see, I can talk forever. I love it. But, I love <laughs> it. it. Makes my job easy. <laughs> <laughs> but then, and then the, how, again, as, apropos of what I was talking about in terms of uh, of uh, people uh, seeing you in one part, and they think they think that's what, who you are. Well, as a result, <clears throat> what happened was the next movie. Uh, Phil D'Antoni and Billy Friedkin mm. were, were were casting a French Connection, and they loved that movie. And one of them said, "Let's get him," and the other one said, "No, he's got an accent. <laughs> he's from Spain." And I was lucky that the casting person that was in that room happened to know I was a New York actor, and they said, "No, no, he doesn't have an accent. He's putting it on." So you know, if, if you leave it up to if you leave it up to it, one convinced the other one that I was from Spain, I had a Spanish accent, I would have never gotten French connection. Amazing. And and so that's how it is. And then to to, uh, to make even things funnier, after I finished French Connection, uh, I go back to it. They were, they were casting for Seven Ups, which is right after it, the same producers, and they had in the newspaper they wanted a Tony Lobianco type. <laughs> you got a type. I was already a type, and I'd done two movies, two different movies. Wow. And the same producers, they went to the, uh, I said, hey, what about me? <laughs> you think I'll do? Why don't you give me the job? <laughs> give me the job. Yeah. What type? Get out of here. I'm broke. <laughs> Unbelievable. That's, That's how I got that role. Yeah, timing, I mean, as an actor, like I said, as an actor, timing is everything. I mean, it really is. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely. Cliche. It's cliche, but it, I mean, it's, so I want to I yeah. circle back to the French Connection. And Tony, every time I watch yeah. the French Connection, I watch you, I watch, you know, um, Gene Hackman, Roy Scheider, and let me yeah. tell you something. You guys look like you're frostbitten. Well, <laughs> oh, literally, oh, those, those those two movies, French Connection and Seven Up, were freezing. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys looked at the makeup wasn't helping. <laughs> no, no, and I tell you, we we that, those guys, we all got along so well in that movie. I mean, uh, Roy Scheider, I'd known for many a year. I uh, worked in five different projects with him. Gene, I didn't know, but we all got along. And Sonny Grasso, whose story it was, Grasso right. and Eddie Egan, uh, we, were, we were very good friends. I used to go out with him on on a patrol sometime, you know, with the, uh, you know, in some cases and some situation just for research and so on in New York City. I think he had a small role in it. Didn't he have a small part? In what? In French Connection? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't think so. No? Uh, and the, more, the more I look at it, Sal Boca, you take a look at that role, and then uh, I mean, I'm footed by third build or fourth build. Yeah. I think I think it was uh, yeah fourth build in that uh, up up with the same with all the boys. So it's a, it's it's a bigger part than I thought it was even, and it's an important part, and uh, it's the it's no. The did part it, yeah, I'm sorry. They, I'm sorry. Didn't Sonny Grasso have a small part in it? Oh, small Sonny. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah he yeah, just yeah, had yeah. a bit. Oh, Sonny. Yeah, Sonny had a small part. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm reacting to it, to, uh, you know, because of, of Gene Hackman being the lead and, and Roy and so on and so forth. And, and uh, also uh, uh, the Fernando friend. Ray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, they, didn't, they didn't want him, did they? they? No, it's another funny story. This crazy <laughs> life, this, this acting business. Yeah, yeah. You know, <clears throat> Phil D'Antoni and, and the producer and Billy Freakin, the director, uh, saw a f- foreign film. And they said, oh, good, let's get him. So, uh, Fernando Ray, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, the actor on the screen. So they called the agent and they, they uh, negotiated a contract. And uh, Billy Freakin went to go meet him at the airport. And he gets off the plane and Freakin says, oh, my gosh, they sent us the wrong actor. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted the other actor in the movie. Oh, and they said he, and he calls, he calls uh, Phil D'Antoni and says, what are we going to do? And Phil says, well, what does he look like? He says, he's, well, he's got a beard. Say, well, you ask him if he will shave it off. <laughs> so Billy says, well, you shave your beard? He says, no, 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 no. I have bad skin underneath. The cup. So this guy turned out to be great. Yeah, he was great. Fantastic. Was great. So polished. And so polished. Was yeah. yeah, but you see how, how weird, how yeah. weird this business is? And that's what, you know, I, love, that's what I love about this, the old stories, because, you know, people don't see the behind the scenes. They like to dig them up, you know? It's great. Right, exactly, uh, exactly. You know, Tony, uh, director, the great William Friedkin, he he, he encouraged impro- improvisation in some scenes. Did you do any of that in some of your scenes? 
Well, let's see. Uh, I, I, you know, I like to always stick to the words and make it look like mm. I'm improvising. But, uh, uh, but you know, there's, there was one scene in Washington right. where Billy, you know, as, a, as an actor-director, you know, I've been around with the theater so long that uh, before I do movies, I know so much about the, the trade, the direction, and what have you. I... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, he said to me, all you do is going to have to ask me a question. You know, like, where, he said, well, where would you be in this scene? And I, Ooh. I said, okay, I'm sitting on that bench over there. and reading a newspaper. The limousine will come down this street here. I'll get up. I'll throw the news- newspaper in the trash can that's right there. And uh, and then when Fernando Ray gets out, we'll walk. You want to see the Capitol building in the background, Ooh. don't you? Yeah, 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 so, okay. Then we'll go down here. We'll do a walk and talk. You put track down. And we'll do the, and we'll do a walk and talk on the uh, on the street in front of the Capitol. He says, "Great, okay." And Sonny, where will you be? He says, "Well, Sonny said, well, I'll be behind a car watching them." I said, "No, no, Sonny, you know, no, you're you see those steps way over there? You're sitting on those steps eating lunch and with binoculars watching us." And Freakin says, "That's the way we're doing the scene. Send out for binoculars." <laughs> And that's and that's how that scene got wow. got to be done. Yeah, yeah. Gene Hackman sitting you know, on the steps. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I did throw a couple of lines, and you know when I'm when I'm in um, uh, what the heck is it? the Weissman's office uh, uh, building? Uh, the the guy I forget his name. I don't think his name was Weissman. I forget what it was. But the uh, the the guy with the money, and I and I said, and I'm trying to convince him <clears throat> to uh, make a deal with the Frenchman. And I say, hey, this guy's got him like that, you know? Yeah, 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 was, yeah. That was, that was my... Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, so... Uh, yeah, that, was I mean, great, that was a great scene. I remember that scene. Well, they let, they let, you know, you if you if you come up with some good ideas, you know, uh, and you give them the, uh, you know, a hint that you... you it lets you go, you know, and yeah. I do it when I'm directing. Yeah, Scorsese is like that, from what I understand, he's like that. He's, oh, yeah, I understand, he's a lot, he's a lot like that. Yeah, yeah very a lot loose, of improv, very loose. So. Um, but I, you see, I think one, the only thing I don't like about it is you, you shoot, they shoot a lot, a lot of film, but today it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, it's all digital. They're barely using film, you know, but the improvisation bit of, uh, you know, I don't like the idea of throwing a lot of stuff against the wall and then see what sticks. Right. Uh, I, uh, and then say, oh, yeah, it's art. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think you have to achieve that. You have to achieve that in rehearsal. You have to achieve it with, with uh, making it look real, making it look like you're, you're making it up. You know, but it should be written in the script as as uh, as it is. And then you uh, you have to work with with what's there and and make it uh, make it real, make it look like it's just happening. You know. Uh, you know, uh, William Freakin, that was like a guerrilla filming, you know, I, mean, what, what, I forget the term is, but they call it, he, he didn't really pull too many permits, and the actual, the actual traffic jam <laughs> on the bridge was an actual traffic jam. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, we were, we were a little reckless yes. <laughs> in making <laughs> that, and making those films in New York City. Well, we had cops with us, you know, oh. they were detectives with us and cops with us, so, you know, still we, and it was back in the 70s when a lot of things were just... We're fine and dandy, you know? Yeah, you get, uh, you get away with everything. And, yeah, you know, yeah, Freakin yeah. obviously showed the really gritty side of New York City, which wasn't really too difficult to do back then. Right, exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and, and and real police work, you know. You know not, not somebody looking over your shoulder, and you get some information when you, when you need it, you know? Do you think so. they still throw the hat in the back of the... So they, you think they still throw that in the back windshield anymore? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, but, <laughs> So you, see, you got like a, you must have a million stories. I'm gonna try my hardest to pull some out of out of you. I but, do. <laughs> but you work you work with Milton Berle. Talk about that for a minute. Ah uh, yes, that was funny. I was doing I was doing the Honeymoon Killers. You see. Oh right, right. And right. Uh, Herb Herb uh, Gardner, who was director writer of uh, of this play called The Goodbye People, well, he hired me to play Milton Berle's son. Now it was one of the few times that Ms. Milton Berle was doing a Broadway play. I don't know, maybe it was his first. I don't know. But uh, he's, uh, you know, he was uh, very well established, of course. And uh, so when I uh, was talking to Herb, uh, the Herb Gardner, I said, "So who are you getting?" He said, "Milton Burrow." I said, "Milton Burrow." I said, "What are you going to do? What are you going to do when he when he doesn't get the laugh? He's going to turn into Milton Burrow." He said, "Well, I'll 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 put a nose on him, and so I'll make him another character." 
So he did that, and that lasted about a moment. But before, <laughs> <laughs> but before that, when he hired me, I said to him, "Listen, Herb, I'm I'm doing a movie, The Honeymoon Killers, and I'll be finished within a week." Across from Milton, and Milton says, "Who's this?" And they said, "That's a son. You're going to play your son." And I'm now I'm Raymond Fernandez. <laughs> I'm doing Raymond Fernandez over there, you see. Right, right, so I've right. turned into Raymond Fernandez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now he says, he's my son. He says, my son. So we do the reading. We finish the reading. And I know I'm in trouble immediately, you know. So I go back to my movie, and I finish the movie, and I call, and I say, I'm on my way. Uh, the stage manager says, don't hurry. <laughs> don't hurry the fatal words I wow. love it so I said don't hurry what do you mean don't hurry he said well while you were away <laughs> we uh, rehearsed that scene with your understudy and you know he looks a lot more like Milton than you do and so we're going to go with him and so I talk now to Herb and Herb says uh, Tony I'm having so much problems with Milton I said, uh, I said Herb just give, uh, just give me a half hour Look, he says, Tony, I got to call my instincts. I said, give me a half hour and I will transform back and I'll show you. Because you hired me. You know I can do that mm. and so on. He said, okay. He says, all right, I, I'll call you tomorrow. I said, don't call me tomorrow. I said, tell me now. I said, you, I said you're going to call me tomorrow. You're going to say, I have to go with my instincts and go with the other guy. Right, right, I right. Said, he, says, so he says, no, 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 I'll call you tomorrow. He calls me tomorrow and he says, I have to go with the other guy. I got to follow my instincts. <laughs> I said, all right, listen, how do you what I'm going to do? I'm going to understudy that part mm. that you took away from me. Oh, wow. He said, what? He said, yeah, I want to be the understudy now. He said, well, you don't have to do that. You have a run of the play contract because you're understudying the other lead uh, opposite Milton. I said, yeah, no, I'll do both. He said, you're saving me money. I said, I, I know. I said, I'll do both. Before we go out of town, they're having a, a little run-through with the, all the hoi polloi in New York. The hoi polloi. I mean, you name it, the hoi polloi. <laughs> um, uh, Hal Prince, uh, Elaine May, Mike Nichols. Wow. You name them, everybody's going to be at this uh, before, we, before we leave. And Herb says to me, Tony, can you come in a half hour before, he says, and just rehearse that scene? Uh, read that scene for me. I said, I don't read it. I said, I know it by now. He says, okay, okay. So I come in, and I and the producer's there, Cy Fewer. And he says, okay. Uh, yeah, I said, do the scene for Cy, for Cy Fewer. He says, see, that's, that's wonderful. So Herb comes in. Now, Herb is all a flutter because he got all these people out there. Herb comes in, and I said, Herb, Herb, what? What? I'm going to do, you want me to do that, read the scene for you? Oh, okay, yeah. So I do it. He says, Tony, that's wonderful. Uh, can you do it tonight? <laughs> I said, sure. Uh, but, but one thing, Herb, what? He says, I said, I don't like the way you directed the scene. Oh. He says, what do you mean? I said, well, you, uh, it's wrong. It's, the scene is directed wrong. This is the way the scene should go. <laughs> so, I, so, so now I'm redirecting the whole scene. He says to me, okay. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. You, you do what you want to do. Just keep out of the way of Milton. <laughs> that was my direction. Keep out of the way of Milton. Oh, so now I go, and now I can, now I said, okay, I'm doing, so now I go to Milton. And I, you know, I, I said, Milton. He said, what? I said, I'm your son tonight. He said, you're my son tonight? I said, yeah, just say a couple of words to me so I can understand your voice and my voice. I'll do a couple of words. Okay, good. Very good. So now, <laughs> We go and we do this scene. Now, I've never rehearsed it. Right, you know, right. I can do blocking. And so, so, so we do the scene, and there's a big pause. And he turns to me in the middle of the show, and he says, Are you going to say the line, or are we going to bring the curtain down? <laughs> it's the stage manager says, Milton, it's not him, it's you. You're up. The oh. line is, oh, oh wow. throw some the line. <laughs> oh my God! So now we finish the thing, and uh, Milton comes out in his bathrobe and towel around his neck, which is normal for him. And he right, takes right. his bow, and he says to the audience, "I'm sorry. I'm this. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to do the kid. The, I'm sorry." He says, "It wasn't the kid's fault. It was mine." And I bet you never thought you'd hear Milton Berle apologize. Wow. <laughs> hey, I like that. Oh happens. my God! Oh, well, this is a great Broadway story. Let yeah, me yeah. tell you. So now, <clears throat> now I'm. Uh, we're going to do a rose tattoo. 
on Broadway. Milton Katselis is directing. And uh, Harry Guadino is playing uh, Manja Cavallo. And Maureen Stapleton. Oh, wow. Maureen Stapleton, the great Maureen yes. Stapleton, uh, is playing uh, uh, the woman uh, the, on a Magnani part. Their first day of rehearsal, uh, Milton turns to me after a little bit and he says, Listen, uh, you're making Harry Guadino very nervous by being here. So w- w- can you not watch rehearsal? <laughs> what, the, what do you mean not watch rehearsal? What, I'm, the, I'm the standby. I'm, uh, he said, yeah, but you, you, we'll, we'll get to you. Uh, so now I still don't have a rehearsal. They're running. And then I get a notice from, from uh, one of the cast members. And she says to me, you know, we're moving to Broadway at the Billy Rose Theater. I said, really? No, oh, nobody's ever told me anything. <laughs> so what happens is uh, I, I call and I say, "What? you know, I haven't had a rehearsal. I haven't got a costume. Like, What's going on here? And now you're telling me you're moving to Broadway? He says, and yes, and everybody's getting a $10 raise, which meant we were getting $125 from a week uh, <laughs> from the, where we were to $135 oh. a week. Wow. So I said, no, no, not me. I'm not getting that. He said, what do you mean? I said, I want 250 <laughs> He said, well, no, 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 no. I called. Get, get, get everybody there. Get the cousins. This may be the first and last thing you see me on Broadway. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, get everybody out of the family. Right, right. So we go, uh, this, is like, this is like an hour before the sh- curtain goes up. An hour before. So I run it back over there. And I'm running all over the, you know, Harry is on the floor. I said, Harry, I need your costume. <laughs> now, Harry's taller than I am. He's big as, I'm taking his pants off. Him. I'm whirling my his <laughs> pants up. His shoes, I got to put paper in his shoes. Wow. You know, I'm wearing his costume. He's like, and, and then I said, I don't even know how big the theater is. It goes, it goes very well, very wow, well indeed. That's great. Including the, 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 uh, uh, curtain call, which was a tarantella. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm going along and pushing me around, you know. They, did so you, that was just great. Did, we did, did it for you, a week. Did, did you end up getting a two fifty? Yeah, oh yeah, I got, I got <laughs> Harry's salary for the week. Oh, you got his salary. Big shot. You got the two fifty. Big shot. <laughs> yeah, I did the show for. I think it was seven hundred fifty dollars. Wow. That's very call for the week. Beautiful. Yeah. It was fun. This has Crazy. been great, and uh, folks. Please visit TonyLobianco.com. It's a fascinating website. Tony's one of the greats in the industry and is an absolute gentleman. And, uh, Tony, I mean, I'm going to have you back on because I know you got millions of stories, and uh, this has been great. All right, Tony, thank you so much, and we will talk to you down the road. All right, folks, what a great interview. What a, what a doll. Tony Lobianco, uh, one of the, like I said, one of the greats in the industry. Uh, Tony's a doll. He's an absolute doll, and I really appreciate him taking the time to be on my show. He's, he's a great guy. And, uh, folks, please visit TonyLobianco.com. And, folks, we talked about it for a short period of time, but please check out Just a Common Soldier. Okay, just a common soldier.com. It's got, like Tony said, over 26 million views. It's a wonderful, wonderful, he narrates a wonderful video for our wonderful soldiers out there and um, our heroes. They are, they are the real heroes, not the people you see on television, the sports athletes, the politicians, you know, the, 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 the jerks, you know, the people look up to. And, um, our soldiers are our true heroes. So visit just a common soldier. We're going to play it right now, right as our outro, folks. Bring a tear to your eye. Check it out. And let us take that moment to honor those who we call heroes. But they will tell us that all they are are merely common soldiers. getting old and paunchy and his hair was falling fast and he sat around the legion telling stories of the past of a war that he had fought in and the deeds that he had done in his exploits with his buddies 
They were heroes, every one. And though sometimes to his neighbors his tales became a joke, all his legion buddies listened, for they knew whereof he spoke. But we'll hear his tales no longer, for old Bill has passed away. The world's a little poor, for a soldier died today. He will not be mourned by many, just his children and his wife, for he lived an ordinary and quite uneventful life. He held a job and raised a family, quietly going his own way. And the world won't note his passing, though a soldier died today. When politicians leave this earth, their bodies lie in state, while thousands note their passing and proclaim that they were great. Papers tell their whole life stories from the time that they were young, but the passing of a soldier goes unnoticed and unsung. Is the greatest contribution to the welfare of our land a guy who breaks his promise and cons his fellow man? Or the ordinary fellow who in times of war and strife goes off to serve his country and offers up his life? A politician's stipend and the style in which he lives are sometimes disproportionate to the service that he gives, while the ordinary soldier, who has offered up his all, is paid off with a medal and perhaps a pension, small. It's so easy to forget them, for it was so long ago that the old bills of our country went to battle. But we know it was not the politicians with their compromises and ploys who won for us the freedom that our country now enjoys. Should you find yourself in danger with your enemies at hand, would you want a politician with his ever-shifting stand? Or would you prefer a soldier who has sworn to defend his home his kin and country, and would fight until the end. He was just a common soldier, and his ranks are growing thin. But his presence should remind us we may need his like again. For when countries are in conflict, then we find the soldier's part is to clean up all the troubles that the politicians start. If we cannot do him honor while he's here to hear the praise, then at least let's give him homage at the ending of his days. Perhaps just a simple headline in a paper that would say, Our country is in mourning for a soldier died. We all thank you for your service, we thank you for your time, and we thank you for giving us what we have today.